again, everyone. You're joining us for a very special episode of Executive Platform's Blueprint Podcast Series. My name is Jeff Mix. I'm Head of Content and Research, and we are recording another edition of the Speaker Roundtable Series. Uh, we are recording this at the North American Supply Chain Executive Summit in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, my guests today are Greg Javor of uh, Mattel, uh, Katie Holman of General Mills, uh, Fern Hernandez of uh, the Boeing Company, and uh, Donna Wharton of Microsoft. I'm so excited for this conversation. Uh, we have gotten about 700 submissions, actually more than 700 submissions, from the supply chain executives attending this show about what they would like some of the uh, speaker faculty to discuss, and uh, why don't we get right into it. Um, so our first topic, about a third of all the submissions we received are about digital transformation. Uh, I think it's fair to say just about every supply chain organization in the world is doing something in a digital transformation journey. Uh, it's probably also fair to say most supply chain leaders wish they were further ahead in that journey. There are some stumbling blocks, there are some challenges, uh, and I wonder if the panel could just uh, maybe give some advice about maybe where you are, uh, some thoughts for what maybe supply chain leaders can do to unstick their organizations if they are stalled. Um, why don't we throw it to the group and see who has something to say. Um, so where we're at, so we actually did a, one of the things that we did within our organization, what we call culture and capability. Culture and capability, culture is understanding where we're at from a knowledge perspective of what people do. Uh, we did a week in a life survey. We did a uh, assessment of soft skills and hard skills from a culture perspective. From a capability perspective, we did an assessment of where we were as a whole from a maturity level ranking ourselves from one to four, one being very transactional, to four being end-to-end -end digitally uh, uh, solutions that we have in place to run the business more effectively. We actually rated ourselves about a two and a half, we're right around two and a half, and recognize we've got a, probably about a set, uh, a handful of set of activities to move us from both what individuals do, um, individuals, re their job responsibility, and clarity of what they do, and then the systems and applications to get us there as well. So we actually moved uh, individuals into, I would say, about four different roles. Uh, strategic sourcing, category management, procure to pay, and then we introduced what we call the center of expertise or center of excellence, where a lot of the uh, transactional tactical activities that happen on a day-to-day -day basis are performed at as well. And we also looked at uh, internal work and also uh, uh, third-party sourcing as well. Yeah, I mean, we've been on a digital transformation journey for... Uh, since I've been running the supply chain, so about seven years now. And I will tell you, we haven't always gotten the ROI right. Um, but I think we've got some key lessons learned that I I'll share with the group. And I think the first one is recognizing that data is an asset, that you can't measure what you can't see. I think we learned a lot of that through COVID, through supply chain shortages. Um, and so that has been a pillar for us from an investment perspective. And then the second thing is we've changed our, our approach on how we measure ROI. Um, we've pulled ROI forward. Instead of having these long, drawn-out, three-year ROIs, which, quite frankly, never really met the muster or delivered the value that we all envisioned when we started the program. So we brought that in and said, what can the program develop, d deliver in the next six months or a year? And then more importantly, who's the owner of that? What's the business value and how do we hold ourselves accountable um, because we're investing money that could be probably put in product development. So we feel, I would say, a, a higher level of responsibility to make sure we're delivering on the value propositions. And then the third, and you touched on this, Fern, is the, is the culture ready? Mm -hmm. I've, I had to stop several projects because we were ahead of where the team was mm -hmm. and they just were not going to be able to absorb the change. And so we've looked at how do we make the organization, how do we improve the skill set of the organization as you talked about, how do we increase our, our tech um, I, IQ, how do we make sure people understand how to, how to manage data, how to uh, achieve the results through the technology. And that means you have to understand your processes, you have to understand your skill sets, and, and most importantly, you have to have the mindset of the organization there with you. Yeah. So that, I think, has always been kind of undervalued, and we now understand that's probably one of the top priorities to, to yield a, a, a ROI for the organization. 
As yeah. you were talking, there's so many things there that resonate uh, with a similar journey uh, at General Mills. I would say we also tried to pull how we're going to digitize our supply chain for quite some time. And there's been a few things that I think have really changed in the last few years for us. Uh, so the first was our CEO declared we want to be a leader in data and analytics in the food industry. And so having that top-down support has been incredible, which then allowed us like, okay, how do we cascade this now into supply chain? What does that look like? Um, and one of the first things, you talked about data as an asset. We sort of missed that, I think, before. And so we had all these disparate systems and then disparate projects and really this huge shift to get all this operational data into the cloud. That's been a massive unlock for us. So it would have taken us years before. We're literally making cap developing capabilities now three times faster than we did before. That's great. Um, we have transparency now. We can actually mm -hmm. see where the problems are. So that was a huge unlock. And then we also changed how we approach solving some of these problems. So we start with a business problem as well. Um, and we've set up uh, what we call these agile pods. It's from the software industry. Um, and similar, before we were very traditional project management, it could take a year, sometimes three years before this project was done and then there'd be this big reveal. And instead, with these pods, we have representation from the business, supply chain, IT, working together in these weekly sprints and uh, feeling fast, I mean, and really embracing mm -hmm. that. And at the end of each week, they're literally doing user testing with like the end users of these capabilities and getting that feedback quickly and iterating. So we're bringing these capabilities also to life faster and hitting that ROI faster. Um, and it's impacting the culture in a different way too. Because again, before with the big reveal, it was kind of hit or miss <laughs> if that was going to be accepted, that big, huge project. Uh, and by doing it this way and involving those end users as you're going along and seeing the progress too, um, our adoption rate and not just the adoption rate, but people like embracing it and continuing to give feedback to those teams, it's really allowed us to move faster, get to the ROI faster, um, and people getting more excited about what might come. Yeah. Yeah, I, I look at digital, a lot of the same things. We, we uh, would have two uh, sort of pillars you know, at Mattel, and, and everyone's seen one of them with unlocking our IP with uh, the Barbie movie, which has been a big <laughs> success. But, you know, behind that, as far as we, we call it optimizing for growth, and I think that's where a lot of the digital, you know, transformation is taking place. First of all, we've, we've had to optimize our, our manufacturing footprint and our logistics footprint. You know, what I would call uh, the logistics side is all channels and brands in a single distribution network, which led us to upgrading our, 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 what I call, you know, old systems uh, with an ordered invoice system that would take care of like Shopify on, on the front end uh, that you're going to use for your, you know, your, your e-commerce marketplace as we're growing this business. Uh, then your distribution order management and then your, obviously your WMS and then uh, agent assisted ordering. All, all, all those pillars, you know, giving us a lot of capability, a lot of digital capability that, that we didn't have that, that we're unlocking to, to with our ambitions to, to grow the business. And then mm -hmm. I would also say we're, we're going to be fundamentally, it's not, uh, you know, anything rocket science, but we're, you know, we're, 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 we're moving, you know, out of Excel and access, you know, because that was a lot of what, Nothing you know, wrong with Excel. Excel no, is a great you know, tool. People, Nothing you know, wrong with Excel. Excel. The world <laughs> runs on it. But to, but to more, you know, you know, with data lakes and Tableau mm. and, and, you know, very structured and we, we see the benefit and then ultimately, you know, we're going to have more visible factories with facts and data that we, we use, right? But still a long way to go. Yeah. As we were collating the submissions that we were getting, um, AI came up a lot. And I think AI has always been part of the digital transformation conversation for years, but it is definitely in the spotlight at the moment, and I can only imagine it's about to move into maybe a star and role uh, in the near future. And I wonder if we could go around the table and maybe talk a little bit about how you think AI is going to impact how you and your team work. Well, I guess I can start with this one because uh, our CEO is basically pivoting our entire company around AI. And, you know, the way that, that I think about it is we're, we're going to have uh, offerings that include AI, we, we call those co-pilot. So think of the software offerings that we have today and you can buy a co-pilot to help you with that. Even mm -hmm. on Excel, um, you can buy it with co-pilot and you can have Excel build you tables, pivots, etc. cetera. Um, so you know, that will be uh, part of you know, our new business model going forward. 
But in supply chain, the way that we're thinking about AI is more of an assist. And we, we are investing in this right now. We're, we're thinking about personas, like who are the people who need and could benefit from AI assist? A factory manager, for example. Um, and then we're looking at how is the maturity level, like there might be a level one assist versus a level five assist. And what we mean by that is a level one assist might be, I just need some questions answered. A level two or level three might be the AI assist is telling the factory manager there's an issue and here's a recommendation on how to solve that issue. And then a level five is that the AI is actually running all of that autonomously. Okay, I think where we're at is more the one to three, you know, that middle category we're focused on building those first. And quite frankly, um, you know, there's a lot of investment required to build these large language models. Mm. Like if you just something simple, if you just put in, what is my FG inventory uh, value today? Okay, you have to let the AI assist know that FG means finished goods. Yeah. So there's this whole learning that is, is happening, and we are having a fast, agile model um, to learn and say, hey, we thought that this was going to be really good, but it didn't deliver you know, as, as high a level of quality of answers as we'd liked. And so there's this training, that an investment in training that has to happen. And that is going to be required time from our teams as well as time from the large learning uh, trainers that are, you know, developing these models. But it's, I'm, I'm super excited about what's ahead and how it's going to unleash a lot of productivity for the team. I love that you're starting this framework with the people in mind. Mm -hmm. Like, who is this going to impact? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we are that sophisticated yet. We've looked at it more from a standpoint of, uh, like you said, what is going to be help and assisting and where can you just like kind of let the machine go run for you? Um, but I'm actually going to take this back because it really at the end of the day, like thinking about who is doing what and what type of help might they need. Um, but we are also still, I mean, people have been using AI for a little while now and um, I do believe it is accelerating and I think everyone, at least we're trying to internally kind of grapple with like, okay, but how much and where? And so I think having this kind of framework to kind of help, you know, step through that would be really helpful. Yeah, I'm going to take that as a follow up. Yeah, we, we're doing very similar information. Mm -hmm. uh, the way the our approach is very similar. We've got it by role or personas mm -hmm. um, into re, into the type of uh, analytics that you actually want mm -hmm. that are driven by either ML or AI. Um, in our manufacturing space, we've got a ton of control points, or digital systems, or digital twins, or simulations, mm -hmm. are way down the roads. Um, from a procurement standpoint, we're actually about a few years ago. Uh, we introduced uh, a product called Orpheus, and that actually helped uh, with us with us with spend analytics. And we actually had to teach it and train it before the ML started to kick in. Mm. We we actually got down from a category one to a category level four of the UNSPSE standardization elements. And then after a while, the system would start to pull in those elements and drive the analytics together through the machine learning it did to tell us where our spend categories were at a pretty deep level mm -hmm. by business unit, by site, uh, by uh, location within the factory, by part, and then also by um, the, uh, the level of, uh, of the product that where it was being used in the pricing structure of where we we're paying for it across the company. Mm -hmm. It was huge. And then we also introduced um, on the back end um, uh, a system that does automated transactions for us. It does three bids and a buy, essentially, mm -hmm. and then it'll start to apply, oh, we're continuing to buy these products from these set of suppliers. It autonomously does that for us and begins to award. And we're just down that path right now, but it's very similar by persona, but down our ways from uh, uh, automating and getting out of manual transactions. Do your suppliers know they're dealing with an, an AI? Uh, they, do. The, they do. They do. Okay. We, uh, and I would say that's probably the other aspect as you're going down the yeah. path of digital transformation. There's different stakeholders that you have. You have your old, your your internal organization, mm -hmm. 
you have your internal customers, but you got to have your suppliers, and you got to bring everybody with you along the way down your path. Yeah, so. yeah I, I think you know when I I start at the high level. The prediction is that seven out of ten jobs are going to be different, mm. are replaced through AI very shortly. You know, when we talk about the industrial revolution, it took like seventy years to bring people off the farms into mm. different jobs. So, it is it is a pretty big uh, sort of contrast. I don't know if it's going to happen that fast. We're going to start right. small. I could see it. You know, on you know either disruptions in the supply chain or things that happen with inventory, and it will help you with the decision making you know, with AI on, you know, what the decisions are that you can go back to your commercial teams and, you know, or your customer service teams or customers to, you know, on the impact uh, and have quicker, better decision making with AI. I think that's probably basic where we'll start uh, and then, you know, uh, and crawl with it and then, and then look at the opportunities that everybody's talking about later. The next question that I want to talk about is uh, about forecasting and sales and operational planning. When I was collating the different submissions from delegates, uh, I was really surprised how many of them were conveying a sense that the old ways of doing it aren't good enough anymore. In this new environment of uh, change and disruption, just the, the tried and tested and true forecasting isn't getting the job done anymore. And uh, not every organization is as lucky as Mattel with a, a Barbie movie coming down the horizon that you can do the forecasting for with a pretty good sense that you're going to have a, a good couple quarters. I wonder if we could go around the table and talk a little bit about how supply chain leaders should be uh, rethinking sales and operational planning and forecasting to better meet the needs of their organization. Um, can we start with you? Sure. I mean, understanding what your customers are going to sell is probably the holy grail and <laughs> it, 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 it has you know a lot of opportunity and always will I mean there's internal disciplines around you know what we may call like uh, match what our sales team you know predicts we're going to sell and you know we, we rigorously measure you know our match you know to that to that inventory and, and that's sort of our internal lifeblood you know also sales and operations planning it's a lot longer term uh, especially when a lot of your you know, manufacturing is done overseas and in Asia that you, you, you have to plan for. So we'll, we'll plan the SNOP on a long-term horizon. Uh, the SNOE, or Sales Operations and Execution, is now almost separate, you know, where you're, you're, you're planning that execution along with what, you know, what you're going to ship, you know, week by week and, and really nailing, uh, I think, nailing the discipline with, uh, you know, across your, your sales team and, and, and planning and logistics teams that you're, you, you really need to... to that. So I think a lot of internal discipline has really paid off uh, with rigor in, in, in how we execute uh, and execute you know, going from what you'd call a effective to efficient uh, in your entire supply chain. So did your sales team accurately yeah. forecast the bar Barbie sales? I think, you know, we, we certainly had unique merchandise that we obviously projected a lift and, and you know, it, a lot of these things, a big surprise, you know, that, you know, sold out and so you're, you're chasing. Right, which is always good uh, to be in the position, uh, you know, to chase. Very similar to the pandemic, when, mm -hmm. when sales grew, and and you know, I think some of the lessons from the pandemic have really helped us. So it's pretty, mm -hmm. you know, pretty relaxed uh, to do that. And then, of course, you know, the the demand from our direct to consumer side has been phenomenal, right, on this. And you know, we I'll, I'll give one example uh, that you'll see. Uh, you know, there's a a sweatshirt we came out of the 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 premiere the pre the preview to the premiere and it was like, hey, we're going to do that I am Knuff sweatshirt. <laughs> and uh, we pre-sold a lot online and, you know, they're coming in and it's it's sort of a you know one-off on a consumer product, but, you know, a pretty neat success story that, you know, where your supply chain has got to be flexible and nimble. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're not going to always get everything, you know, perfect, but, you know, we're going to come together as a team to, you know, to, to support that mm -hmm. and, and have a good success. The piece you said around uh, with your SNOE process mm -hmm. and having discipline, I actually think uh, COVID helped forge this more for us. I mm -hmm. can't imagine getting through the pandemic without the SNOE process, and it brought all of our teams together, mm -hmm. our sales team, our brand team, our manufacturing teams, our planning. I mean, it really, I don't know how we even would have managed through all of it without the discipline of this. So. I wouldn't say like throw out the playbook, it doesn't work. Um, what we did learn though was one of the reasons it became so critical important was because things were changing so often. And so SNOP, you're right, it's like this much further horizon. Um, and in these moments where things take off, uh, it's your SNOE that kind of really gets you through. But without that discipline, 
Um, I don't know how we would have managed through all of that chaos, frankly. I think the other piece that we've learned is with the forecasting, um, a lot of our stat models, you know, we're a food company and people started eating at home and similarly our demand just like went through the roof um, and we weren't ready for it. And so again, I think the SONE process week over week helped us execute and then keeping everybody on the same page and where we were headed. Uh, and then we also had to take a step back though and look at how have we been forecasting and is that right? How often should we be evaluating our models? Um, and so it's also, I think, helped us maybe even prove some of our longer term forecasting too, uh, because you can't just let things sit. You constantly have to go back and evaluate and adjust and make sure, make sure they're still doing the right thing. I'll, I'll add on to what you guys yeah. are saying because um, we had the exact same situation. SNOE became the glue yes. of the entire organization. Yeah. And yeah. nobody, I mean, this was where you got the information. Mm -hmm. um, what I think has changed now is that we didn't have to worry about demand for three years. And so we're actually rebuilding this demand muscle, which mm -hmm. is, it's really a lot of fun um, because now we're looking at it with kind of just a, 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 you know, white paper, like how would we do this now, right? We, wanna, we want to acknowledge that we're gonna have disruptions. We have to think about demand differently. So the way that we're doing it is we're having a kind of a, a 13 week horizon, which the SNOE team runs, but this 13 week horizon, which we're leaning in big time to tech. So we're leaning into all of our data elements that are coming in on a daily basis. And then every week we're outlooking the next 13 weeks. And that's a very light human touch uh, and very heavy tech. So we, we look at that and we're like, this is where we're going. And it is the, the heartbeat, the yes. drumbeat yes. of the organization and business planning for sales, marketing, finance for, for the business teams. And then, but the SNOE team is also looking at, okay, what is our midterm demand and what does that horizon look like? And what are the decisions that we need to make, whether it's marketing decisions, uh, product decisions, uh, financial decisions. And that's the muscle that we're really investing in right now and trying to figure out the right mix of tech and human. Mm. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's you know, maybe, maybe I could come back and talk about that in an, another year as far as like what kind of transformation we've done there. But I do feel like we kind of have lost the muscle you know, we, we've got to go remind ourselves what's that muscle memory we had. Yeah. Because the longer term demand on the SNOP horizon, which for my team is a completely different organization than the SNOE team, you know, they're, they're looking at product roadmaps. They're like, they have a different set of parameters that they're, they're using. And they're also leaning into tech as well, but they're looking at different market indicators, right? This kind of four months to 12 months is, is I think a unique opportunity for us to rethink how we do demand planning. And we haven't figured it out yet, but we're, we're experimenting and we're making some changes there. But I think that's, that's a real opportunity for us. Yeah, and for us, you know, we're a big heavy industrial. You know, we build, we build major platforms. So demand planning is, is huge for us. Mm -hmm. Um, what we did over the last few years have, have created what we call value stream mapping exercises to understand um, what our skyline is going to be, uh, where our supply chain risks are going to be. We've got a greater uh, field operations that are giving us an understanding of what's happening in the supply base because that's an issue we all ran into um, and, and we weren't as prepared as, as maybe we would have liked to have been. That field operations and, and it gives us uh, hey, they're growing, uh, they've got staff deficiencies, uh, they've got capital assets that maybe aren't working, uh, which gives us those indicators to, to plan around. And that, that, that's a big piece of it for us. And then the demand planning, you guys said it really well, discipline and rigor. Um, that has changed for us. We've, we've enhanced that for us, but what's changed is our lead times. Things that were six weeks, are now 18 weeks. Mm -hmm. Things that were six months are now 24 months. Mm -hmm. And we have to be really cautious um, to not get into the bottlenecking that many of us run into. Everybody started, oh, it's 24 months? Great, I'm gonna add and add and add demand into the system versus working with our suppliers to have an understanding of their 
uh, capacity uh, so that we would enter the right demand at the right time versus bottlenecking them and ourselves as well, having shortages. Um, so we're continuing to add that rigor and that discipline for us to, to manage that skyline for us. As long as we're having a conversation about issues and trends, I, I don't think we can have a conversation without talking about uh, talent and labor issues. Um, it's impacting every industry, it's impacting every uh, discipline. Uh, supply chain professionals certainly aren't immune to that. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about what your companies might be doing differently that might be interesting to a, an audience of supply chain professionals dealing with some of these challenges. Um, why don't we start with you, Fern? Sure. So from a talent and labor perspective, uh, I think the aerospace and defense uh, sector in particular, we've lost a lot of talent um, over the last five years. And we're going to continue to lose some of that talent in the next five years. So we've really uh, doubled down on our training, uh, our internship programs, our mentorship programs, our onboarding programs. And we've, we've been working quite a bit with the universities and technical affiliations that we have out there on preparing the next generation. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, there's generational gaps between 7, 10, and 15 years. Our 15-year-plus individuals, um, not as many of them that are out there. Um, so the 7- to 10-year folks, they're now what we call our seasoned employees. Um, and we've got to help them uh, gain the knowledge that our 15-years individuals would have had a lot faster. And then the new entrance into the workforce, uh, we've been really working heavily with onboarding. And onboarding is different than it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, the, the capacity of individuals that are coming on, they've been working with these systems, the software, these applications since they were little. So the, the pickup is significantly faster. Individuals want to start doing their job day one uh, versus going through an entire learning module. And we've been having to slow that down a little bit for some of those individuals to make sure they understand uh, the rigor that we do within our job and the quality and the level of expertise that we're looking for them. So the onboarding has been differently for us. Working with the universities and setting up, specifically on the supply chain side, subcontract management uh, aspects to the curriculum has been big for us. Mm -hmm. Right now, most of the supply chain uh, uh, students that come out of the university are heavy on the transportation, warehouse, logistics space. We've been adding the acquisition aspect to it, uh, the legal and acquisition aspect to it, into that curriculum with the universities uh, significantly more. And then how we interact with the new employees and getting them trained with the, with the, the seasoned generation is, is an area that we're starting to learn how to do that because the new generation of employees learn faster, learn different modes as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just, hey, come in and read this, read these procedures and manuals. It's video, mm -hmm. it's direct feedback, uh, reinforcement of the positive things. It's, it's significantly a different way of looking at uh, uh, new generation of employees for us. Well, I think you, you start with the only long-term wealth a company has for its survival over the long term is, is people, right? Yeah. So um, I think a lot of cultural, uh, you know, basic things on you know, what, what Mattel stands for, diversity, equity, and inclusion, our citizenship report, and, you know, that, that will, you know, and we're, 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 we're fairly written up and, and fairly successful with that, and that, that, that attracts people, right, and you've got to continue that. I think the internship programs and a lot of what Fern talked about, you know, it, you, you've got to have that because you, you want to see talent that's putting pressure on, you know, your managers and up. You want that, you know, from the b grassroots pressure. To, to, to that, that helps the culture and helps performance. And then from, you know, a logistics talent and like in your distribution centers, it is scarce. You're, you're going to have pockets on that where you've just got to be laser focused, uh, you know, uh, with your, your HR teams uh, and with the local teams on, you know, how you're bringing talent in your thinking, how you're understanding, you know, with great data, you know, what that market and what that, that area, you know, has and how you're going to differentiate yourself and, you know, we do a lot of what I call employer of choice campaigns, mm -hmm. you know, at the grassroots level uh, to, to make sure that, you know, the people coming in, you know, from a, uh, a training and then retention standpoint, uh, it's more family, right? It's, it's, I think it's the extra, extra things you do, like the Barbie movie. Every distribution center rented out a theater and, 
you know, we took uh, oh, and we took the whole family and and folks to the movie, right? Which is, you know, it it, it speaks to being part of the family. Yeah, I, sure. So uh, very a lot of strong parallels here. I would say, you know, for our team, I would call them more of our, our corporate teams, um, focusing heavily on this new generation, these ways of working. As a company, we've also been we call it work with heart. So. What we're finding is, you know, after the pandemic, uh, things are shifting and changing. And so I think there's a lot more flexibility on where you work from. And we talk about when we come together, it's for moments that matter, a heavy focus on development. Um, we've really been focusing on becoming business leaders with supply chain expertise. So how do we start to build that up in our team members? And so obviously we have our mentorship programs, but also um, making sure that they're getting the right experiences across the organization, so being really thoughtful on development. For our manufacturing plants, uh, we are losing a lot of really seasoned talent. Mm -hmm. And so I was just talking to one plant manager and he was sharing his third shift is 60% less than one year. Um, wow. And that's where you have kind of the, the least amount of help, right? You're mm -hmm. on the night shift, the mm -hmm. engineers aren't there. Um, if you have high seniority, you've gotten to days, right? And so we've also had to look differently at learning and development and what does that look like and how do you onboard um, because people do learn differently. Uh, we're also still trying to figure out, um, we call it like our work value proposition because, you know, coming into the workforce 20 years ago and working at a manufacturing plant seven days a week, we run 24 hours a day, we just, we did it, I did it, like we just did it. and. That's not exciting to people. And so we're also trying to figure out like, okay, how, how are we changing the work? This is where I do think tech can help us. And where are we, where can we automate? And yes, there's headcount savings, but frankly, it's really because we want people to do more engaging work. They would prefer to be on day shift. So like, what might our roadmap be to touchless manufacturing? But again, there will be savings from it, but really it's about, we have this workforce that wants to engage differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna have to change. Um, and then similar, also looking at like HR has been a huge partner with getting us the data on retention hiring. Um, our VP of HR for supply chain, she actually went and applied for a job to see like how that felt. And we hadn't updated any of those systems or processes in years. And she's like, that was painful. I can't believe. <laughs> like, they're using this. They're using this <laughs> when, you know, um, the labor market is so tight right now yeah. and you're competing for great talent. It takes me almost a day just to fill out your application. Well, I could have applied to 10 other places by now. And so I think it's also been eye-opening for us that uh, we needed to update a lot of our processes as well. Uh, so it's been a good thing, but um, it's definitely been a learning, a learning journey. Yeah. But there's some similar experiences here. I think we're also leaning into experiences. Mm. Um, and in order to help people with their career journey, it's important to understand what kind of experiences they need, what kind of skill sets are they looking to learn and providing a lot of that learning. Like, I think about my own career and it was, well, you learn on the job. Mm -hmm. It's a very different approach to learning. It is, it is part of the job. You have to carve out time and think about what skills you want to learn and people who are more seasoned in their career versus people earlier in their career, they have completely different skill sets. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, part of, I think, the challenge is this loss of manufacturing knowledge. Mm. Um, one of the things that we're going to pilot, so I'll let you know how it goes, yes. is use HoloLens okay. to, you know, because we can't keep flying people around to factories, yes. and especially if they're in China, et cetera, or other parts of the world. And so can you use a HoloLens to understand and get a better connection to the factory and what's happening so that you can make better decisions based on what you're doing back at corporate or at a product level or at a, uh, a, a business segment level. And uh, so that's another piece that we're leaning into. And then I think lastly, the hybrid workforce is mm. here to stay. And I'm a big believer and supporter that hybrid will be the way to attract talent. And, and I've seen it firsthand where we've identified great talent, but they don't want to be in Seattle. Mm. And especially if they're more experienced um, and you talk about kind of that seven to 10 year, you know, it's very difficult. They've got their support systems. If they have a family, et cetera, they don't want to move. And so we had to make a decision 
do we go to them or do we pass and you know maybe take on somebody who maybe is not as great you know fit because they are willing to move and we've opted for hybrid yeah. so we're learning a lot um, and it's it's definitely harder it was a lot easier when everybody was in the office yes. um, but I think as a leader I I, I really it started to embrace, hey, this is a leadership challenge that you have to be willing to take in order to attract talent, grow your organization, and meet people where they're at. Because to your point, people came out of COVID with just a different set yeah. of work-life balance yeah. and what that means to them. And I think it's really important that we're meeting our employees where they're at and, and trying new things. And so that's, that's the approach we're taking. This whole conversation has been Terrific. And I, I guess I want to finish with one last question about controlling costs. Um, the world has gotten a lot more expensive in recent years. Uh, all the different facets that connect one end of a supply chain to the other have gotten more expensive, whether it's labor or transportation or anything. I mean, even just uh, building resiliency into an organization, a lot of organizations have opted to invest in inventory, which costs more money. Um, I don't think we're going to come up with a silver bullet going around the table in just a few minutes, but I think it's worth talking about all the same. What advice do you have for supply chain leaders who are trying to control costs in a more expensive world? Can we start with you, Donna? Sure. I, I mean, listen, inventory and cost control are the fundamentals of supply chain. It's, it's really what we do and a big part of our value proposition to our business units. Um, let me start with cost cutting first. I think managing costs is just a key deliverable. And whether it's in good times or bad times, whether your business is booming or not, it's having the operations rigor around managing costs that's so important. I think for us, we're, we're really getting into a level of granularity around where those opportunities lie. And we have like a much more partnership approach on how we manage costs. So I think in the past, it used to be, you know, we would have a target. We'd send a bunch of sourcing people, go after the target. Um, and now, you know, all of those, I would say, you know, uh, low-hanging fruit, they're, they're gone. The, the bigger opportunities are going to require a lot more coordination across product development, mm -hmm. across sales and marketing, across finance, and across supply chain. And that's where when we start to understand maybe we need a different business model, maybe we need to look at our SKU uh, proliferation, and, you know, of course, sourcing and making sure that we're managing the cost through contract negotiations and visibility all the way down. I mean, you, Vern, you mentioned having the visibility, getting better visibility down through kind of tier four supply chain to understand where those cost blockers are. Um, th those are all part of, I think, the, the approach that we're taking on cost management. But it is a fundamental and it is, you know, definitely risen to the top of the priority list for us, for sure. And then on inventory, um, we have absolutely changed from a just-in-case to back to this just-in-time, but I would say with a caveat. And the caveat is that, again, I think precision is the key word here on both costs and inventory. We're being very precise on where we need to inventory, to, to buffer inventories based on if there's a lead time, issue, if it's a single or sole source part, mm -hmm. um, you know, based on the product's life cycle. And so we're bringing a lot more um, uh, assessment into where we're spending money. Um, and, and the other thing is we're starting to do a better job of connecting what we're buying down to the component level all the way through to the market demand picture that we talked about, and Vern, you touched on that as well. And I think doing a better job of understanding the flow, uh, which, you know, for the past three years, we didn't have to worry about demand. We just worried about getting more supply. So now building that muscle, I think, is also is making us better supply chain professionals and being able to articulate, like, when we do have an issue, why that, that issue has existed. And, and I think just bringing all of our stakeholders a little bit more into the work we do in supply chain, which isn't a bad thing. Yeah, I can build on that. I can start with the inventory piece. So from an inventory standpoint, this shift from a supply constrained environment to demand one, 
that was painful, right? <laughs> uh, so, because you had already produced it and it needed mm -hmm. to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So working through that, you know, as things have stabilized, um, I liked how you called it, uh, we're building back up our demand muscle because mm -hmm. truly for the last few years, like whatever we could make, like people, people needed it. And we're shifting now and changing. And I would say we're getting smarter about it too. We have more data than we did before. And so I liked how you called it assessment. We've been calling it segmentation but really thinking about, this is where I want to be a little bit heavier. Um, it could be a key customer. It could be because of the lead time. Uh, it could be because of our, we have a lot of seasonal businesses. Uh, and so we're just being smarter now, I think, than maybe uh, we have in these last few years about it because we can't just build up all this, all this inventory. And then from a cost standpoint, you know, one of the things that actually uh, General Mills has done for a long time, so beyond supply chain, we call it our holistic margin management program. And um, at the heart of it, it's a productivity program. And so rather than coming at it as like cost savings like each year, it's this ongoing pipeline build that we have. And as it's matured, it has become more cross-functional. And so my marketing managers are involved, my sales manager, finance, R&D, trying to figure out, okay, out of all of these costs, um, you have targets anywhere between three and 5% every year. And so you're working on them, like we're working on next fiscal years now, because right now we're executing the ideas that we came up with last year. Um, what we have found is the low hanging fruit feels like it's gone. And that's really where this maturity has evolved to. You can no longer just do it with great sourcing contracts, manufacturing, getting their yield down or up. Um, you've got to start connecting across, mm -hmm. um, across silos. And frankly, I think the next step for us is gonna be with our suppliers. Again, this has been still more inside of the walls of General Mills, but I think this next evolution is gonna to have to be how do we partner even with, further back with our suppliers on potential ideas. I love what you said in regards to having people understand the margins play of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, being in supply chain, you're always worried about cost. Yeah, That is one of, you know, a handful of key metrics that you just manage uh, being in the space. But connecting the teams to understand what the impact is to the business, mm -hmm. that's huge. They then understand, hey, I'm going to impact margins by 1% to 2%. And companies like the size of ours, that's tens of millions, if not is. billions of dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And knowing that they've had an impact to it, that, that's a big piece for it for us. Um, I'm going to take a little different spin on the inventory piece yeah. of it. Uh, we actually uh, made some decisions to, to manage work movement that then addresses our costs and our inventory as well. We've um, stood up organizations um, that we actually call our work movement managers. You know, we have work going from internal to external, external to external, external back to internal. Mm -hmm. And we've doubled down our efforts to manage the the, the plan for the cut-in of whatever those parts may be and the, and the inventory and demand for those parts as well. So as we do work transfer or work movement from supplier to supplier, we say, hey, we're going to grow our inventory in this space so that we have give enough time for the new provider to get to prepare for that cut-in plan mm -hmm. as well. And we'll do that together with the incumbent and or the new supplier mm -hmm. and even internally as we go to external as well. So looking at it from a different perspective around workflow and work management and work movement is where we started to go down the path as well. Yeah, if, I, if I start with, uh, you know, inventory, you know, first of all, our business during the pandemic grew 29%. So there was a lot of exuberance and, you know, a, first of all, <laughs> congratulations. Yeah, on that. That's yeah. exciting. A, a lot of bets being placed and obviously the back half of 2022 was, you know, an eye opener. And, and mm -hmm. you know, you've got to work yourself through that. Uh, I feel really good about uh, how the teams, you know, cross-functionally across the business work through that. And then hopefully you m make sure you have that muscle memory. Of, Did anybody see that coming? I would uh, like to know. I don't think anyone. Whoever, yeah. whoever yeah. that is, no, I'd, like, I'd, like, I'd, like, I'd like you to have them yes. on their po your yes. podcast next yeah. because I don't think, yeah. I think all of us had the overhead. Yeah. But we, you know, we, 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 we realized it, you know, again, late and uh, have course corrected and hopefully you come out with the muscle memory to say it's one team one set of numbers mm -hmm. you know if you're chasing an AOP and then all of a sudden you're you're putting 20 percent onto that and, and we're making it and all the signals are you know to continue to make your you, you have to understand the consequences of that so I think we come out with more of one set of numbers on S and OP and how we we operate 
You know, as far as cost, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll start with a quote from Ben Franklin, necessity never made for a good bargain, right? So we're always going to have, uh, you know, rigor around the planning cycles uh, with procurement on what we need to do. Uh, make sure you have good should costs, right, and understand your should cost on whether it's a product or a service mm. and, and, and make sure you have that, that, that rigor in place for cost and we, we do a, you know, we, 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 we've come a long way on that and, you know, it, uh, it pays off. But I think all the supply chain, you're always going to have sort of the C for cost on your forehead when oh, you yeah. go into the boardrooms. Oh, and, yeah. And, and, you know, and then the last one would be, you know, investing uh, the coaching in your people yeah. to, to make sure they understand the details of costs and how they impact it, mm -hmm. and, and and how they influence to, to sort of raise their, their 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 influence up, and you know at the at, at more senior levels is is, is really important uh, in the organization. I like that you guys are using shit costs. We do as as well. We actually even got to the point um, we're doing uh, teardown labs. So you oh, know yeah. we, we brought in a product, we took it apart, understand the components to it and tried to get mm -hmm. an understanding of the cost associated with those components to, to what we were paying as well. Yep. I think that was such an important topic to wrap up our conversation on. I want to thank all of you for your time. This has been so uh, generous of you to share some of what your organizations are doing and some advice for our listeners. Um, I guess it just leaves me to say thank you, everyone, for, for joining us, and let's do it again soon.